This week on the A Push Show, we're talking Chapter 21, America and the Great War. We'll talk about the big stick, America and the world between 1901 and 1917. I guess it's better to have a big stick than to have a big stink. We'll look at the road to war. I wonder if it's a literal road or one of those metaphorical roads, kind of like the Underground Railroad, which I was very disappointed to learn was metaphorical. We'll look at the war without stint. Man, I hope they don't have heart problems because a war without stint may lead to a heart attack. We'll look at the war in American society. How did Americans handle their first major international total war? Did they handle it well or did they kind of freak out and divide against each other? Or maybe they did a little bit of both. We shall see. We'll look at the futile search for social unity. They say resistance is futile, but is the search for social unity futile too? I guess it would be futile to not wait and see and find out. We'll look at the search for the new world order. I don't know why it's so hard to search for the new world order. You just have to find where Hollywood Hulk Hogan is, because he is ready to mess up the WCW. And lastly, we'll look at a society in turmoil. Hmm, all up in turmoil? Sounds like things could get real slippery. All this and more this week on the A-Push Show. at chapter 21, which is all about the United States' approach to foreign policy in the early 20th century, it's important to remember that the United States has a little bit of a history of being isolationist. Fewer than half of Americans today even own a passport. We're kind of into just sort of staying in our own country, which somewhat makes sense because other countries are very far away, and our country is very big and has a lot of stuff to see in it for its own right. But back then, that was even more so the case, as Americans were very much interested in just American things and not really in affairs overseas. And one would think that this would somewhat hamstring leaders back then, but in a lot of ways they found it liberating as they could get entangled in foreign affairs without a whole lot of interest from the American public at the time. Theodore Roosevelt would seek to use American power throughout the world through his most often quoted maxim, speak softly, but carry a big stick. Which is basically a phrase that means talk is cheap, but having a very capable way of crushing and killing your enemy is very valuable. You're an animal. How Roosevelt would decide to use that power was in the form of two different standards, one racial, one economic. Roosevelt had a racist view of the world in tune with most leaders of predominantly white countries in North America and Europe, and that view was that countries ruled by whites were civilized, and countries ruled by non-whites, Slavic people, and Latinos were uncivilized and therefore fit to be conquered by civilized countries in order to maintain the world order. He would also add an economic basis as the nation of Japan would be added on the roster of civilized country because of their massively successful efforts at modernizing their military and economy in the 19th century. This perspective of Japan as civilized would be apparent in Roosevelt's effort to appease the Japanese and maintain our open-door policy in Asia. The open-door policy was essentially a rule that Americans would conduct trade however they wanted in Asia. Roosevelt was able to mediate a truce between Japan and Russia in the Russo-Japanese War of 1906, in which the Japanese effectively embarrassed the Russian Empire. The agreement was that the Japanese wouldn't take any more land from Russia, they would keep the lands they did win from Russia, and the U.S. got to keep their free trade status. However, Japan began to expand and exclude the United States from trading freely in their growing Pacific Empire. As a show of not-so-subtle white supremacist force, the United States launched the Great White Fleet, which was literally a bunch of U.S. warships painted white that traveled around the world to show Japan who's boss. Roosevelt also took a special interest in the affairs of Latin America, a region long assumed to be under the control of the United States via the Monroe Doctrine. For a long time, the U.S. would engage in Latin American affairs if Europeans seemed to be meddling where they shouldn't be meddling. 
However, Roosevelt would take this a step further as he determined the sources of European intrusion in Latin America were not only aggressive policies of Europe, but also seemingly careless actions taken by Latin American countries themselves. In order to prevent Latin American countries from doing things like owing a European country a bunch of money and thus inviting conflict, as was the case in Venezuela in 1902, Roosevelt would establish the Roosevelt Corollary, which sought to take direct action over Latin American governments to preserve order. This would inspire the U.S. to send troops to several different Latin American countries early in the 20th century to either crush or encourage various rebellions, whichever benefited the United States the most at the time. As was mentioned in Chapter 19, the United States would establish the Platt Amendment, which effectively gave the United States control over the freshly independent nation of Cuba, who had just won independence from Spain with the help of the United States. However, Roosevelt's most enduring legacy of foreign policy would come in the completion of the Panama Canal. A sea route across Central America had long been desired for literally centuries as people were really, really tired of having to travel all the way around the southern edge of South America in order to get from Europe to the eastern edge of Asia. I know, Taft. Crazy far. You gonna turn around and let the people see your pretty face or you just gonna lay there? A French company had begun building a canal across the narrow isthmus of Panama, which was a part of the nation of Colombia at the time. The United States agreed to pay for the completion of the project, but had to get Colombia to agree. When the Colombian government refused to accept U.S. demands without more and more payment, Roosevelt sought to work around the Colombians by encouraging and providing support for a revolution for Panamanian independence. With heavy support from the United States military, the Panamanians would win independence in 1903, agree to follow the U.S. to finish the canal, and the U.S. would finish building the canal 11 years later in 1914. Taft, is it cool if I talk about your namesake approach to foreign policy? I'll do my best. Taft the human also looked to expand America's interests overseas, but didn't share the same view as Roosevelt about maintaining some sort of racialized economic order. He would institute a policy that critics would call dollar diplomacy, as the Taft administration would invest in less developed economic regions. Nicaragua was one such region. U.S. mining companies would incite an insurrection in the country, and the U.S. federal government would further support this initiative by sending troops to support the insurgents. After the government was taken over by the insurgents, United States banks were encouraged to give sizable loans to the new government, which gave the United States the leverage it needed to use military intervention for a decade in Nicaragua when the new government was threatened by yet another insurrection. With the Wilson administration, we see a president who started out as being inexperienced and for the most part disinterested in foreign policy. However, he would prove to be one of the presidents who was most defined by foreign policy. For a long time, Mexico was ruled by a corrupt dictator named Porfirio Diaz. However, when Diaz was overthrown by the popular leader Francisco Madero, American business leaders were worried as they had for decades enjoyed a nice exploitative relationship with Mexico. The worry was that the Madero government would end that, so the Taft administration quietly encouraged and supported reactionary general Victoriano Huerta to depose Madero. Before the U.S. could voice their support for the new government, Huerta had Madero murdered, which caused President Wilson to express that he would never recognize a government of what he called butchers. Wilson hoped that his refusal to recognize the new government would be enough to topple it, but he was wrong. Huerta was heavily supported by wealthy American businessmen and was able to establish a military dictatorship. After a mix-up involving the arrest of American sailors in Tampico and Mexico's refusal to apologize via a 21-gun salute, Wilson moved to seize the Mexican port of Veracruz. The incident resulted in the deaths of 126 Mexican soldiers and 19 Americans. It would also result in Huerta being toppled by a faction led by Venustiano Carranza. Carranza would refuse United States demands for their government and almost angered Wilson enough to support revolutionary Pancho Villa to depose of Carranza. <laughs> 
But Wilson felt Via lacked the support and strength and abandoned him, which enraged Via to the point where he would lead a series of violent raids into American territory where he and his forces killed a few dozen Americans. Wilson would send troops to attack and capture Villa, but they never did. In March of 1917, Wilson recognized the Carranza regime and focused his attention to this little conflict in Europe that we now refer to as World War I. Now, as this class is an American history class, I'm not going to go all out into the causes of World War I, but I'll at least give you a little bit of context so you kind of know what's going on. By the start of the second decade of the 20th century, Europe had become incredibly industrialized, incredibly imperial, and fiercely competitive and divided. Two major alliances would emerge with the Triple Alliance of Germany, Austria-Hungary, one country, and Italy, and the Triple Entente of the United Kingdom, France, and Russia. In reality, the two main powers and two main enemies would be the United Kingdom and Germany. The UK, the United Kingdom, had been for years the world's leading empire and Germany was doing its best to catch up and was doing a pretty good job at closing the gap because they made the UK big mad. The intensity would spill over because of exactly what German Chancellor and Mustache Hall of Famer Otto von Bismarck predicted, some damned thing in the Balkans. Austro-Hungarian leader Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated by a Serbian nationalist, and the Serbians were allied with Russians, and since a Russian ally killed an Austro-Hungarian leader, this would drag all members of the Triple Alliance and Triple Entente into a war that would see 9 million people slaughtered. For a long time, the United States tried to remain neutral, but conditions and greed made it tough. Seeing a huge opportunity, many businessmen tried to sell supplies to anyone they could sell supplies to in the war. However, Britain, with its powerful navy, instituted a blockade around Germany, which prevented any sales to Germany. The truly neutral thing to do would be to sell supplies and ammunition to no one, but American businessmen simply could not resist the profits to be made by becoming the arsenal of England which is not to be confused with Arsenal Football Club of England, who are very, very stupid and dumb. Selling munitions caused a massive economic boom for the American economy during the outset of the war in 1914, but also fostered a lot of resentment from the Germans who began to use their newly developed U-boats or submarines to stop the United States from giving supplies to the Allies. When U-boats sank the passenger ship the Lusitania, killing nearly 1,200 civilians, including 128 Americans, Americans were outraged, and the movement towards United States involvement seemed increasingly more inevitable. But despite Wilson's incessant pro-war rhetoric and global circumstances that seemed to pull the United States toward war in Europe, Wilson had an election to win, and he felt his best chance was to appeal to the pacifist element of American society. And in case you don't know what pacifism is, it's an ideology of peace. Think of like a pacifier. A pacifier pacifies a baby. It makes it peaceful after it's all crying and carrying on. Sometimes I wish they made pacifiers for you-know-whats, because you-know-who can be a bit of a baby sometimes. <laughs> Nothing. Wilson would up the pacifist rhetoric on the campaign trail as he would run as the candidate who, quote-unquote, kept us out of war. However, he did approve for a massive increase in the nation's armed forces in 1915. Wilson would narrowly beat the Republican candidate in Charles Evans by only 600,000 votes and 23 electoral votes. Wilson realized early on that fighting in Europe was not only inevitable, but somewhat advantageous in his vision of a post-war world. He wanted to establish a new alliance system called the League of Nations, which would help avert future wars and ensure self-determination for all nations. Wilson would contend that these goals were worth fighting for, but Wilson would still need provocation into the war to satisfy his moral standing. Well, he'd find that provocation in the Zimmerman telegram. After years of a brutal stalemate in the trenches of France, Germany launched a series of desperate attacks in Europe, the seas, and abroad. They would launch huge and costly offenses on the battlefield, attack without regard with their U-boats, and attempt to lure Mexico into waging war with the United States. However, before that message could get from Germany to Mexico, it was intercepted by British spies and sent to Woodrow Wilson. 
Wilson had the provocation he needed. Congress would officially declare war on April 6, 1917. The vote was not unanimous. In the next section, we'll take a look at the brutal stalemate that was World War I. We'll look at how the United States' entry in the war was a massive turning point in the outcome of the war, and we'll see how the war managed to slaughter 9 million people. Up until 1917, the war had been a brutal stalemate as both Allied and Entente tactics failed to reflect the military technology at the time. It was also the first large-scale total war, meaning all nations would completely throw all of their manpower and resources into the war effort. Because of this, soldiers on both sides of the conflict would be senselessly thrown at the other side in the desperate and doomed determination that the next offensive would be the one to break the opposition, regardless of how poorly all the previous offenses had gone, and regardless of how many machine guns, bullets, and artillery shells the other side had ready and waiting. England and France were literally running out of men to draft into the army, and Russia dropped out of the war after decades of internal dissent and a downright disgraceful performance fighting the Germans inspired a successful revolution by a group of socialists known as the Bolsheviks. Germany would now focus all of its efforts on France and England. Without the assistance of the Americans, France and England's ability to hold off the Germans may have been doomed. But Americans would come to the aid of their allies in great numbers. American ships assisted in re-establishing safe transport of supplies and troops across the Atlantic. American troops of the American Expeditionary Force would flood into Europe by the thousands thanks to the Selective Service Act of 1917, which instituted a draft in the United States. Though many opposed the draft, the Selective Service Act would be passed through ensuring 3 million soldiers would be conscripted to join the 2 million that had volunteered. Ensuring troop morale was difficult given the brutal nature of World War I's trench warfare. Fighting was marked with high casualty rates, and conditions in the trenches were often filthy, rat-infested, wet nightmares that were under constant bombardment from enemy shells. Life away from the war proved to also be dangerous for soldiers, but for other reasons, as one out of every ten American soldiers contracted sexually transmitted infections from exploring the assorted bars and brothels of Europe. African American soldiers would be drafted as well into the segregated American Expeditionary Force. Nearly 400,000 blacks enlisted or were drafted, and over 50,000 would fight, many hoping for a chance to improve their status by fighting on the battlefield for their country. However, racist hostility by Americans toward all black regiments continued during the war. In August of 1917, a group of black soldiers training in Houston had had enough abuse from the white community and used their weapons to fight back, killing 17 whites. 13 African-American soldiers were hanged. Without going into a great ton of detail, in terms of the all-time rankings of worst wars to fight in, World War I is probably one of the strongest candidates for the worst. Modern warfare involving machine guns, long-range artillery shells, and poison gas created a war that involved long periods of sitting in dirty, wet, rat-infested trenches as bombs were dropped on you until you had to get up and run at another trench, watch several of your friends get blown to pieces or drown to death on their own insides, fight to take another trench just to lose it, and end up back to where you were. Later in the war, the use of tanks and airplanes gave combatants a sense of perhaps how future wars would function, but for most soldiers in the First World War, the experience was often cold, dirty, wet, sleep-deprived, and bleak. And I haven't even brought up the use of the dreaded cat gun. Britain, France, Germany, and Russia would each lose well over a million men. Those who survived the war were often crippled physically and also mentally as post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, was common. Though sadly, diagnosis and treatment for PTSD wouldn't emerge for another 60 plus years. Even now, we still kind of stink at treating veterans with PTSD. As mentioned earlier, it was a long and brutal stalemate, and the only upside for American soldiers is that they only had to endure a few months of the war rather than a few years like their French, German, Russian, and British counterparts. Leading the American war effort was General John Pershing, the same guy who was given the job of cantering Pancho Villa, which he failed to do so. 
but the addition of American troops and supplies made it possible for Allied forces to break out of their trenches and advance on the Germans. American troops would assist the French in repelling a German advance at Chateau Thierry, effectively preventing a march on Paris, which was only 50 miles away. American troops would later join the Musée Argonne Offensive, which pushed the German army back after seven months of brutal fighting. With supply lines cut and invasion imminent, German leaders would push for an armistice, which is an end to fighting, though not quite a surrender. But considering the terms Germany agreed to, it might as well have been a surrender. On November 11th, 1918, the war was over. But though the American experience in fighting the war was brief, the effort to get ready for the war was an all-out experience for people who worked in factories, mines, shipyards, and farms in order to provide for the soldiers. And it was also an all-out effort to convince anybody who didn't agree that the war was a good effort to agree. The total bill for the American war effort was $32 billion, which today would be about $548 billion. Wars are insanely expensive, especially total wars, where you have to mobilize an entire nation to either fight in a war or produce stuff for those who are fighting in the war. To pay for this war that was about over 30 times the normal federal budget, the government would sell liberty bonds, which were essentially loans people would give to the government. You could buy a liberty bond, which is basically a savings account, but with the government. You basically give the government some money, they promise to pay it back with interest, and as long as they don't lose the war and get taken over by a different government, it's a very safe investment. However, most people were encouraged to do it out of patriotism, not profit. The other way to raise revenue for the war was through new taxes on business and income. Income and inheritance taxes increased dramatically, with some of the very wealthy paying as much as 70% income tax. Perhaps one of the greatest marvels was how the economy reorganized itself for the war effort. Under the somewhat tight leadership of the War Industries Board, various sectors of the American economy would be consolidated and led by the various business leaders of said industry to produce goods for the war effort. Some areas were incredibly efficient, like domestic food supplies put together by the sharp leadership of Herbert Hoover. Other areas were incredibly inefficient, as they were unable to get supplies out to troops by the time the war ended. But the staunchly laissez-faire American capitalist economy proved that it could pivot to a degree to a more centralized, planned economy, and some began to wonder if such a relationship between government and business could continue in peacetime. The growing bond between government and business would also spill over to labor. Labor unions would earn several key concessions, although most were somewhat temporary. The National War Labor Board would pressure industry leaders to grant things like the eight-hour workday, minimum living standards, equal pay for women, and recognition of the union to organize and bargain collectively. In exchange, unions had to promise not to go on strike, and employers had to promise not to lock out union workers. Union membership would increase by 1.5 million members between 1917 and 18. But though labor became more cooperative with business, violence and militancy between the two groups still existed. In Ludlow, Colorado, a miner strike would turn deadly as striking miners and their families would go on strike at a mine owned by John D. Rockefeller. The state militia was brought in to protect the mine from striking workers who were living with their families in tents as they had been evicted by the company from company lodging. The militia and strike breakers would attack the striking workers' tent colony, causing the deaths of 39 people, 11 of them children. The economy boomed during the war as the European demand for American products, particularly war supplies, exploded with the onset of World War I in 1914. But with many American white men volunteering or getting drafted into war, opportunities for African Americans, Asian Americans, Latino Americans, and female Americans would increase in many industries that were previously off-limits to these groups of people. Perhaps one of the greatest social changes from the war would be the Great Migration, as hundreds of thousands of African Americans would move from the South to Northern cities to find work. Cities like Chicago would see as many as 70,000 new residents as a steady stream of African Americans would seek jobs and also asylum from the poverty, indebtedness, and racism of the South. 
But the North was by no means a Garden of Eden in terms of racial equality. Though many African Americans enjoyed a greater degree of freedom of prosperity than they had experienced down South, racism and hostility were still realities in most Northern cities. Famously, East St. Louis experienced a race riot in 1917 as a white mob attacked a black neighborhood in which houses and businesses were burned and as many as 40 African Americans were killed. This, of course, would not be the last instance of white mob violence against the growing African American communities of the North. And the war provided an opportunity for the United States to come together really like never before, and to a large degree it did. But oftentimes that unification was either short-lived, a lie, or a complete disregard for the civil liberties of a lot of American people. One must remember that before 1917, America was sharply divided on whether or not the United States should get involved. It's not like those voices of dissent went away once the war began. Several groups would gather together to push the cause of peace. German Americans didn't like the war because they were German. The Irish didn't like the war because they hated England. Quakers and Mennonites didn't like the war because they were pacifists. Socialists didn't like the war because they saw it as nothing more than a battle between capitalists for commercial supremacy, which really wasn't all that wrong, actually. Some women's groups also opposed the war like the Women's Peace Party, but many women would abandon this effort once the war started, including the founder of the Women's Peace Party, Carrie Chapman Catt, as she would attempt to make women's suffrage into a wartime effort. But many women continued the anti-war effort under the grounds that as the, quote, mother half of humanity, unquote, they had a special obligation to minimize the damage humanity caused to itself. In somewhat rare fashion, the sequel to World War I, World War II, was way more popular than the original. And though many people gave full-hearted support for World War I, the United States government worried a great deal about the sizable minority of Americans who did not support the war. The most obvious government effort to generate support for the war was the Committee on Public Information, also known as the CPI. Essentially, this was the government wartime propaganda machine. Headed by journalist George Creel, the organization would attempt to push a message of public unity in the face of a hostile, dangerous, and evil enemy abroad. Pamphlets, posters, films, articles, and other literatures would increasingly paint a picture of American soldiers as saviors of humanity and German soldiers as nothing more than demonic beasts bent on merciless and perverse destruction. But in more sinister fashion, the Espionage Act of 1917 gave the government tools on how to spy on Americans who were determined to be undermining the war effort. Stiff penalties were enacted on anyone accused of spying or undermining the efforts of the United States in World War I, though those terms were intentionally not very well defined. Even more repressive still were the Sabotage and Sedition Acts of 1918. These enabled the government to prosecute anyone who criticized the president or the government. More often than not, socialists were the targets. Americans had long supported the persecution of socialists, and the war gave people the spirit they needed to carry out their unconstitutional efforts. Socialist leaders would be in prison or forced to flee abroad to escape long-term imprisonment. Many Americans would also take repression into their own hands as angry mobs across the country would go after fellow citizens who either expressed dissent or had supported those who expressed dissent. Some groups, like the American Protective League, would spy on citizens, open up their mail, tap their telephones, and report their findings to the authorities. It was basically kind of like the book 1984, except it was way before the actual year 1984. Yes, Taft, it is a book. No, books are not dumb, Taft. In fact, they're very smart. The vigilante spirit of ethnocentrism would further spill into society as ethnic communities would often be targets for repression. Irish communities would face backlash because of their resentment towards the United Kingdom. Same thing with Jewish communities for their resentment for the Russian Empire from which many had to escape. However, the most repressed group were undoubtedly the Germans. The Germans were harassed, fired from their jobs, German classes were canceled, German street signs and street names were changed, German foods like Frankfurters were changed to Liberty Sausage and Sauerkraut became Liberty Cabbage. And in one instance in Southern Illinois, a German-American man was lynched. 
Now, most Americans didn't support violence against German Americans, but most did believe that Germans were not to be trusted. Which brings us to the post-war era and the new, more democratic world order that Woodrow Wilson would try to create, but he didn't. Nearly a year before the war ended, Wilson would present his famous plan for the post-war world with his 14 points. In this vision, Wilson presented a world in which large empires were eliminated and people were free to rule themselves as they saw fit. Seas were free to travel, secret treaties were replaced by open covenants, armaments reduced, trade was to be done freely, and the world would be governed by a multinational league of nations. We see Wilson's progressive roots shine in this document, but not his pragmatism. He had no plan on how to free the people who were subjugated and unable to achieve self-governance, and he had no plan on how to solve the economic rivalries that were to a large degree what started World War I in the first place. To a large degree, Wilson was trying to respond to a very similar statement made by the new leader of communist Russia, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Wilson was not only trying to paint the United States as the new world leader instead of Russia, but he was also trying to persuade Lenin to keep Russia in the war, which didn't work. However, Wilson's plan faced a doomed uphill battle at home and abroad. French and British leaders were not too keen on Wilson's moral impositions and were much more interested in exacting vengeful measures on Germany and Austria-Hungary. The English Prime Minister David Lloyd George would even advocate that the German leader Kaiser Wilhelm be arrested and executed. At home, Wilson faced further obstruction in that he tried to tie the 1918 midterm elections to his 14 points. He told the American people that to vote for the opposing Republican Party would potentially ruin his efforts at achieving peace in Europe. This double backfired on Wilson because A, it didn't work as Republicans won both the House and the Senate, and B, Republicans who did support the 14 points were now pissed that they were essentially blackmailed into going against their own party by the president. When Wilson arrived to Paris for the peace conference, he would be hailed as a hero to the war-weary continent. But though the people loved him, the other members of the Big Four, that is the leaders of France, England, and Germany, were not all that interested in what Woodrow, moral high ground Wilson, had to say. They flatly rejected many of Wilson's 14 points, especially the aspects of what to do with Germany's colonies and what to do about war reparations. Wilson would retreat on both counts as Germany would be forced to give up its colonies, give up its military, and pay back $9 billion for the damage caused during the war. The aim was to weaken Germany so that a war never occurred again. As you can clearly see, that worked really well. Not so much. But Wilson wasn't a complete failure. He was able to win self-determination for a few new territories, notably Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia, both of which emerged in the wake of the fall of the Ottoman and Austro-Hungarian empires, respectively. He also did some work to free up the area we know now as Israel, but then was called Palestine and was sort of under control by the Allies, but was supposed to you know what? Palestine was a big giant mess that the United States could not solve in 1918, so we're just going to leave it alone for now and just hopefully it never comes back to really bite us in the rear end. Hey! No body shaming. But Wilson would achieve in the creation of the League of Nations, which he hoped would eventually prove to be more important than the flawed peace treaty created by the Paris Peace Conference. A nine-member council was created with five permanent members residing in the United States, Britain, France, Italy, and Japan. Russia wasn't let in because Wilson was sneakily trying to overthrow the Soviet regime and the United States wouldn't recognize Russia's government until the 1930s. The New League, or Covenant, was Wilson's success, but neither he or anyone else had much of an idea as to how it would work. But getting Congress to ratify the treaty proved to be an obstacle Wilson could not overcome. Many members of Congress, as well as many Americans, had serious concern over what sort of foreign entanglements Wilson's League of Nations would create for a country that had long enjoyed isolation. Demands for reform to the League of Nations would be made and accepted in Wilson's second visit to Paris as he signed the infamous Treaty of Versailles. However, critics in Congress were still unmoved. More reforms were demanded before Congress would sign the treaty. Wilson, who was suffering from the physical effects of a stroke, would refuse to compromise with Congress. 
The leader of the congressional opposition to Wilson's post-war diplomatic efforts would be Henry Cabot Lodge, who was a close friend of Theodore Roosevelt and a hated enemy of Woodrow Wilson. Lodge hated Wilson with the passion of a thousand sons, as he was also motivated by the recent passing of his friend Theodore Roosevelt in 1919, who also hated Wilson. Though the public favored ratifying the treaty, Lodge decided to stall by slowly reading the treaty, all 300 words of it, slowly in committee before people could debate it. It took him two weeks just to read the treaty, and even longer to debate and amend the treaty agreement. Wilson would attempt to appeal to the public in order to speed the process along. However, this effort would prove nearly fatal as Wilson would succumb to a massive stroke after attempting a weeks-long cross-country speaking tour. Bedridden and unable to perform any public duties, his wife and his doctors would essentially shield him from the public eye and handle his daily affairs. When he eventually recovered, Wilson was essentially half paralyzed and suffering from intense emotional and mental swings as a result of his stroke. He refused to compromise on any of the changes presented to the treaty and instructed his fellow Democrats in the Senate to do the same. The treaty would not be ratified, and Wilson hoped that the 1920 elections would help move the process along. His hopes would be dashed as the American public's interest in ratification faded and a new wave of crises would capture their attention. And in the last section, we look at post-war America, in which an economic recession that stemmed from the end of wartime production would dash the hope for a more liberal and progressive society as the United States kind of pendulously swung towards a more repressive and reactionary society. With the war over, businesses were no longer regulated by the government or the war effort. As a result, many businesses would increase prices and rescind benefits to labor. When the post-war economic bubble burst in 1920, inflation was out of control and confidence in the economy plummeted. Over 100,000 businesses went bankrupt, nearly half a million farmers would lose their land, and nearly 5 million Americans lost their jobs. In addition to the post-war recession, since business leaders were so eager to undo all of the concessions they were forced to make to labor during the war, union membership and strikes would spike in the years following the war. In Seattle, a general strike brought the entire city to a standstill. In Boston, a police strike over layoffs and wage cuts would result in massive riots and looting that would require the use of the National Guard to restore order. As a result, the entire Boston police force would be fired and replaced. One of the largest strikes in American history would unfold as 350,000 steelworkers in the East and Midwest walked off the job demanding an eight-hour workday and recognition of the union from management. The strike was long and bitter and violent, with riots emerging in many areas, the climax of which would occur in Gary, Indiana, in which a riot instigated by management and strike breakers would result in the deaths of 18 people. The intensity and violence would cause an intense backlash against the strike and organized labor in general. The effects would be felt for decades. In what becomes a prevailing theme in U.S. history, African Americans would do a great service for the United States, expect concessions for their service, and be severely disappointed. African American soldiers would be hailed as heroes and saviors in Europe, and for a time would also receive similar accolades and victory parades for returning soldiers. But when the parades ended, the music died down, and confetti cleared, the same racist attitudes from before the war would reemerge. African American veterans and workers found no social promotion for their contributions to the war effort, and increased hostility and backlash would ensue as white mobs would sneak to snuff out the growing sense of pride and agency many African Americans began to feel and express. Black workers would be laid off as returning white veterans would be given preferential treatment. Rising black expectations for opportunity coupled with white resentment for said expectations would come to a head in the summer of 1919 as race riots plagued the American landscape. One of the worst instances of rioting would occur in my beloved but deeply flawed city of Chicago. On a brutally hot July day, a group of black children drifted on a makeshift raft in Lake Michigan towards a white beach. They would be attacked by whites, resulting in the drowning death of one of the black teenagers on the makeshift raft. 
Black crowds began to march to white neighborhoods to retaliate, but even larger white crowds would march to black neighborhoods. After days of violence, arson, and rioting, 38 people died, 15 of them white, 23 of them black, with hundreds left injured and over a thousand left homeless. But African Americans did not passively accept white brutality. The NAACP and other groups would urge the American government to protect African American communities and would also urge the communities to protect themselves. A growing movement of black nationalism would emerge as the popularity of Marcus Garvey's United Negro Improvement Association gained support throughout the country. Black communities and black-owned businesses would grow as Garvey's message of black empowerment and self-reliance would gain wide appeal. Garvey would even advocate for a return to Africa, but after a business fraud scandal in 1923, he would be deported to Jamaica. Though Garvey was gone, the growing spirit of black empowerment was not. But the growing empowerment of blacks was not the only thing that scared middle-class whites. They were afraid of reds, too. Reds being communists. The post-World War I era known as the Red Scare was an intense era of repression against a wide spectrum of American citizens who were determined to be or be a part of socialist communist groups. This would largely be leftover fear of socialist mobilization within the working class, but new developments in Russia as a communist regime not only took over but began to actively try and grow communist revolutions abroad including the United States. A series of bombings of various financial and political leaders in 1919 were presumed to be the work of radicals and socialists. As a result, anti-radicalism became as popular as ever before. Along with members of radical or socialist organizations, people who opposed World War I, union leaders, members of the international workers of the world, as well as leaders within the African American community, would be labeled as Reds and Communists. They would be attacked, fired, imprisoned, and deported en masse as a part of the Red Scare. U.S. Attorney General Mitchell Palmer, along with his ambitious assistant J. Edgar Hoover, would stage the Palmer Raids as they would raid socialist organizations to find weapons and explosives. They would find a grand total of three pistols, but arrest nearly 6,000 people, most of whom were released. Nearly 500 would be deported as a result. One of the great trials from this period of repression and overall disregard for civil rights came in the Sacco and Vincetti trial of 1920. Italian immigrants and self-described anarchists, Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vincetti, were arrested on the charge of murdering a guard and paymaster during a robbery in Massachusetts. With virtually no credible evidence against them, in a trial of extraordinary injudiciousness presided by an unreservedly biased judge, Sacco and Vincetti were convicted and sentenced to death. Despite years of worldwide outrage, numerous appeals, and continued advocacy of innocence, both men were executed via the electric chair on August 23, 1927. The names Sacco and Vincetti would become rallying cries for civil rights advocates for generations. But in a somewhat unexpected but relieving turn, a refutation of the Red Scare would emerge. Many Americans were justifiably outraged at the intense breach and disregard of civil rights during this period. As a result, the career of Mitchell Palmer would be ruined, though not J. Edgar Hoover. Also, a new organization of lawyers would emerge that would work to advocate for the civil rights of regular citizens who normally didn't have the money for proper legal representation. The group would become known as the American Civil Liberties Union, otherwise known as the ACLU, and is still a powerful force today. And with the passage of the 19th Amendment, Americans marked a key turning point, though not a complete turn from the era of progressive idealism. Though women had gained the right to vote, the election of 1920 would indicate a strong desire for Americans to return to normalcy. This was literally the campaign slogan of Republican candidate Warren G. Harding, who defeated Democratic candidate James Cox in a landslide in 1920. Americans desired for a return to normalcy, but as is quite often the case in history, when people try to go back to the way things were, they almost always fail. Next week, when we start to look at the 1920s, we'll see Americans struggle to maintain the status quo in the face of the unrelenting forces of change. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. On behalf of Taft and myself, I thank you again. And don't forget, 
keep pushing, G.